Welcome to the High Voltage Light Electric Vehicle Channel. This YouTube channel is dedicated to all aspects of light electric vehicles with weekly videos and a wider community on Discord where you can meet and make friends with fellow enthusiasts. Please consider subscribing to the channel to get notified of new videos. There are links to our Discord community in the description. This video is my review of the CYC Photon Mid-Drive e-bike conversion motor. I apologise for the length of time it's taken to do this, but I wanted to get in more riding though, especially in hot conditions, so I could see how the motor truly handles the heat and how far it can be pushed. It's going to be split up into a bunch of sections and mostly based on questions that people have asked in the comments sections of the other videos that I've made so far. It will look at the various components as well as the serviceability of the motor. There should be some chapters if I've done this right, and if I've missed anything please let me know in the comments. I want to stress that these are my opinions and mine alone. I bought this motor, so I'm going to do my best to be impartial. I have no obligations to sugarcoat anything for the benefit of CYC or anyone else for that matter. Some of the talking might be a bit dry, so I'll be doing this over the top of some riding footage and hopefully you like the scenery where I live. I have my photon motor installed on my Salsa Via bike that's been upgraded to have hydraulic brakes, flat bars and suspension forks. I also added a thud buster seat. It's built for commuting and long distance rides on gravel and moderately rough terrain. The choice of tyres and gearing reflects that. I currently have a 25 amp hour battery in this awesome frame bag from Rogov in Ukraine, which also has enough space for tools and my charger, so if I get my routes correct, I'd be able to stop and charge when needed. The primary goal with this bike is to regain lost fitness and have a good time with friends while doing it. So do I like the motor? Um, yeah, I do. It's, uh, it's a fantastic motor and it lets me ride my bike in a super fun way and cover distances at speeds that I really have no business doing with my wheelie legs. It feels like a bike still in the way that the motor power complements what I do. I love the endurance cycling races like the Tour de France and the Giro. Having this combination of bike and motor lets me experience the kind of riding that these top level guys put out. You can cruise at 55 kph just like in a peloton. You can climb 30 kilometers an hour too. You can still get exercise value from it. There are some caveats to this. At my level of strength and ability, the only way to hit these kinds of speeds is to use the unrestricted mode and put powers to 1500 watts. And now we're reaching temperatures of 25 to 30 C outside. That's not sustainable for long. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. How powerful is it actually? If I was to level a criticism at the e-bike industry in general, it's that they tend to exaggerate the numbers when it comes to the power numbers as well as things like battery range. And CYC are no exception, tending to claim things like 6 kilowatts for the X1 and 2 kilowatts for this one. And yes, you can extract those figures, but not for very long. And in the case of the X1, it tends to result in mechanical issues much more quickly. I would rather more conservative numbers were provided. Perhaps companies are scared that if they choose to be genuine and honest with figures, perhaps this stuff won't sell. It is though a genuine 750 watt motor though, as in you can run sustained periods at this level of power. You can still get it hot doing this though, depending on external temperatures. In cool weather at the start of the year, I was able to push it beyond this for decent periods of time. It's not a big motor, don't expect miracles, but it does feel really great to ride and it's certainly more powerful than the bikes that I think it's aiming at, and that's the commercial offerings from the likes of the big brands like Specialized and Trek, as well as some of the higher end budget places like your Bike Tricks or Hemingway. Who is this motor aimed at? For me, the target market is people who already have a nice bike with good components that want to upgrade to an e-bike. Maybe they're getting older or carrying an injury or medical condition and still want to ride. Whatever the reason for wanting an e-bike, this motor system will let you have one for vastly cheaper than any of the commercial offerings. Not only that, but in the vast majority of cases, you will end up with a much better bike. When I mean commercial, I don't just mean Trek or Specialized, I also mean places like Hemingway or Bike Tricks. Even if you don't have a bike and are looking to get an e-bike, this motor makes sense. Shop about and get a Specialized or a Trek with good components second hand. There are tons of them. Fix it up a bit, slap on a CYC, and you'll have a bike that will crap all over the Turbo Levo 10 grand bikes, both in performance, range, and for about a third of the price. Look at this top of the line Bike Tricks Juggernaut. After taxes, it's close to six grand, for which you get a very heavy bike with some brand name components, but from the lowest price point you can get from SRAM or Shimano. You get a tiny battery that they make ridiculous range claims about. 
so you could buy that or you could use the bike that you have or get a second hand bike which likely has much better components than the bike tricks. Slap on a photon and battery and get a bike with a far higher range that's generally twice as powerful if you want it to be with a much more sophisticated torque sensor than the Buffang one. Not only that but you can pull this off for less than half the price. It will be much lighter and easier to load onto a bike rack. It will just be much much better. It's even more of a no-brainer with some of the bigger names. Those bikes go north of six grand very quickly. For that money, you get a bike with a tiny battery that's super restricted, hard to get parts for and service. If CYC can step up the manufacturing of these and get the service right, then this could really shake things up. Maybe it will force some of these companies to reduce their prices. What is the torque sensor like? This for me is by far the best part of the motor kit. According to the website, it's patent pending, which means the design must have something that sets it apart from previous iterations of torque sensors. It's very responsive and you have three parameters you can tweak to adjust the sensitivity of the sensor as well as how fast the assist power is delivered and the amount. When you're riding it, it basically feels like you have superpowers. If you stick it at the max settings, you pretty much Lance Armstrong fully juiced up. It also still feels exactly like riding a normal bike still. I've tried a few of the Pafang torque sensors and they are not as good as this one. I really like the instant resume you get with the bike. If you have the setting activated then as soon as you put pressure on the pedal it delivers power and this is great. It means that it's really easy to get going from a standing start even on very steep slopes. If you're used to cadence based assist systems then this will be a huge improvement over them. It makes riding in hilly towns much less dangerous as you don't have the wobble phase when you're starting off from a standstill on hills. I've not really used the throttle on my bike that much because the torque assist just provides so much of a better feel. I don't need the throttle to safely start the bike moving like with cadence based assist. I am yet to encounter a situation where it would have been that useful. Potentially in the future it might be more useful if I start to lower the level of assistance. At that point having the throttle on hand for a quick burst to get out of trouble might be handy again. I can see other reasons for having it, it's just with cadence based pedal assist I found the throttle a vital part of the system in order to ride it safely and it's just not with the photon. What's the throttle like? There's nothing wrong with the throttle and it definitely works. It's just not something that I'll be using with this kit, mainly because the torque sensing is so good. If you live somewhere where the throttle is not allowed you're not going to miss it with this motor. I have other bikes that I can go throttle riding with and the power of the motor on this does not give that much of an adrenaline rush with the throttle. It's very much a PAS machine and it does that extremely well. Using the throttle very rapidly builds up heat in the motor, so its use at any amount of power will not be sustainable for long. There are a few scenarios where I think it would still be useful to have one, however, one being if someone was using this motor as part of a recovery from injury or a path back to fitness, in which case being able to call on the throttle to get you home if you felt you'd push things too far would, would be a good thing. In terms of the throttle itself, they're using the Wuxang company, which has a reputation of being high quality. I'm not a huge fan of the thumb type, I prefer a half twist. You can change the throttle, even tune it to remove deadband in the CYC ride app. I will caution though that the wiring is not the same as Bafang, so if you have an old Bafang throttle lying around, don't use it. The Hygo plugs are the same, so it will plug in, but you can cause damage if you get the 5 volt feed going to the wrong place, and I suggest you contact your dealer or CYC for the pinout if you want to do something like this. What is the best gearing for the bike? I've had loads of questions regarding the gearing for the bike. Which options to go for? There is a 32T, a 38T, a 42T and a 50T. The choice you go for kind of depends on the rear sprocket that you have to some extent. The absolute ideal for most people is if you have one of the really wide 11T to 50T rear cassettes are similar. With that you can have a 50T and get the best of everything. Superb climbing ability as well as the option of going really fast on the flat because you can drive the small gears with that huge 50 tooth sprocket. I think I'm probably going to switch to that option at some point but it's not a huge priority for me right now. I'm using the 38T mostly because the largest gear at the back is 32T. I still wanted to have good climbing power and I felt that the 50T would not have done it for me. I found it to be okay for climbing but still not quite optimal. A true one to one would I think be better for the steepest hills. Riding at high speeds I find this combination will sit between 45 to 50 at a comfortable cadence 
I've had it up to 60 plus, but to do that pushes the cadence up to about 120, which is fine for short bursts, but for distance, not really ideal. And at 70 kilometers an hour, you're going at about 150, which is getting up into sprint ranges. The 32T, I think, will be useful for people that ride tight trails or really, really steep off-road all the time. If you only have small gears on the back and want to use the 32T because of that, I'd suggest that you'd probably be better off changing the rear mech to a wider range cassette because you likely won't have the range of gearing that you want to do either climbing or riding at a decent speed that well. What's the noise like? Is it loud? It sounds quiet in the video. Is it actually? CYC has kind of a, a bad reputation for noise with the X1 and Stealth. Despite claims by each generation that it's quieter, it's not really changed. And in part, that's because they're not really that noisy in decibel terms. The high pitch of the motor creates a whine, which some people find annoying. It's not something that prevents conversation between riders. It is what it is. One of those things you're either okay with or you're not. The photon, however, is whisper quiet. I barely notice it over the wind noise. People certainly don't hear it when I ride it behind them. It's very, very quiet and it's definitely on par with something like the BBS HD or BBS A2, probably quieter. It's not quite as quiet as a hub motor, but it's definitely not far off at all. What are the display options and what is the display that I like? I went for the, the compact SW102, uh, which is kind of like the egg rider. It's CYC's own custom firmware and it has a huge range of pages of information that you can scroll through by pushing the menu button. The buttons are actually pretty nice feeling and responsive, which has been a criticism that I've had in the past about this style. There's even a page for heart rate, so presumably there's a way to sync some kind of Bluetooth heart rate monitor at some point. The drawback is its small size. Yes, it has the temperature and RPM data on there, but reading it when it's moving is not easy. But I mostly wanted it because it's compact and neat. If I need to look at something, I can do it via the phone app. I have the option of not using my phone and then I still have a tiny screen whereas with the larger one you just don't have that flexibility and it costs more money too. I did notice a discrepancy with the voltages across all three sources. So taking the BMS as the correct voltage, the display reads low by about 0.8 and the controller reads high by a similar amount. And this differential seems to be constant as the battery is discharged. I've seen this before though with ASI controllers so it's not like it's anything unique. If it could be corrected, that would be good though. The BMS should protect your battery. Um, if you do set your own low voltage limits though, then take the differential into account. Is it easy to build and install? I found it pretty easy. Chainline in particular is excellent and it's very easy to get it right. The instructions from CYC could use with a bit of beefing up, but you can always watch the installation video from myself and others. I don't like the crappy tool for putting on the chain ring. It reminds me a bit of when Luna was selling people that wrench for the BBS HD and wondering why motors were coming loose. If you don't have a torque wrench, I'd borrow one. There are torque specs for a reason, but really just take your time with them. If you're reasonably mechanically competent, you shouldn't have any issues. The only small problem I ran into so far was the crank arms came loose, even though I put them on with the correct torque. I've retightened them since to higher torque and I've not had any other issues with that since. Is it road legal? Ah uh, yes, you can set it to meet the requirements anywhere in the world no matter how draconian the regulations are. I think CYC have been very smart in the way they've implemented the settings to allow the motor to be road legal wherever you are in the world. Just by activating the right profile you can be sure that you can prove in an inspection that the bike has been limited to 750 watts or 500 watts or whatever the speed cutoff is. And that peace of mind, I think, may well encourage more people who were sitting on the fence about taking the conversion route to owning and using an e-bike. What is the warranty on the motor? CYC is giving a two-year warranty for the motor, which is pretty good for this kind of thing. I think that usually a one-year warranty is more often given. It makes me think that they are reasonably confident about the motor. Now saying that is one thing and how the warranty process actually looks to the end user is a very different thing and time will tell. Once we move past a year and motors get older, we will start to see if the groundwork is in place for quick warranty replacement and even how many motors are running into issues. It's hard to get a genuine feel based on social media posts because in general, people tend to post complaints more than my bike is awesome and I have no problems kind of posts. Do you void your warranty by running the motor unrestricted? 
I confirmed with CYC that there are no consequences for running the motor in unrestricted mode, and I am glad about this. It again lends a degree of confidence to the amount of testing done to be bold enough to do this. They could easily have said 750 watts max, and it still would have been a great motor to a lot of people. What are the drawbacks of running unrestricted mode? Essentially, the motor will heat up faster, and potentially there might be a faster degradation of things like grease and internal parts. There's a bit of speculation here because until large numbers of motors start to accumulate big miles, we won't really know some of this. There are limits to lab testing versus actual real world riding. What I can say for certain is that I don't expect to be able to run. What I can say for certain is don't expect to be able to run this motor at high power for long in hot weather and conditions, especially up hills. It gets to 90C and then throttles. It seems very good at throttling, which is a good thing, otherwise they're going to start burning up. Once you hit about 90C, my experience was that the power dropped off to about 600 to 750 range until it cooled, and, until it cooled down and then you could pull more power again. You can feel it doing this in your legs as they start to feel more effort required to maintain speed in whatever gear that you're in. In cooler weather, you'll be able to go much longer. There is a section on why it heats up the way it does if you want more technical information on this, but essentially design choices with this motor limit its ability to shed heat, resulting in it building up quicker than in other motor types. Is it possible to repair the motor? I put this question to CYC and they confirmed that the motor has been built with repair in mind, i.e. all of the parts can be swapped out and changed if there is an issue with one of them. Can the end user repair the motor? The short answer is no. Unless CYC changes their mind, if your motor has an issue, you will need to send it in for repair and a warranty to the dealer where you bought the motor, or direct to CYC if you bought it directly. If you're out of warranty, then you will be paying for service parts. The elephant in the room is that generally they ask you to pay for shipping even when warranty parts are required, and that can get expensive pretty fast. So that sort of sounds like a car dealer. It, and it feels, it feels very much like a car dealer program. If you're not able to open up the motor yourself, you'll not be able to change even the grease. So you'll need to essentially remove the motor and send it in periodically to be maintained. And I know that's going to annoy some people. I think CYC is gambling that there will be a larger pool of people that are okay with that than there is not. Much depends here on the speed and organization of this process. So I think that so if I think that the motor is getting noisy, then I would need to send it in to be re-greased and serviced. If that takes four weeks, then I'm not going to be very impressed. That's four weeks of riding lost. If the turnaround is fast, then it's not really an issue. Will CIC be training and equipping dealers to be able to service the motors? So based on what CYC has told me, dealers will be equipped with tools and procedures to fix and maintain the motors. On the surface, that sounds great. It again comes down to the planning and execution. The dealers selling these are not huge places, so if after two years there starts to be large numbers of requests coming in for repairs and greasing, are they going to be able to keep up? Will there be a fast turnaround of motors? There are already some indications in social media of places struggling to keep up. I hope that all this has been put into place, but ultimately we won't know until these things start to be needed. How long will the grease inside the motors last? CYC have said that the grease inside is estimated to last 20,000 kilometers and has been tested to that point. I don't know if this was in the real world or simulated conditions or what kind of power was being run through to generate those numbers. In general, you would assume that a guy that runs the motor at the thermal limits all the time will need service sooner than this. I'm spitballing a bit, but these are issues and questions that are going to come up and if they are sensible, then CYC will have had a fully fledged plan developed for all of this. Why does the motor perform and heat up the way it does? If you've watched some of my ride videos, you'll have seen the motor temperature climb up quite high, up to 93C on the steepest climb I did, and that was in not very hot weather. The reason for the rapid heat buildup and slower dissipation of heat lies in the choice of motor that CYC went with. There are always compromises when something is designed, so in this case, CYC looked at the qualities they wanted in the motor and picked one that ticked most of the boxes. CYC wanted an extremely compact package that was still capable of delivering a decent amount of torque. So for the Photon, they went with an Outrunner. 
There is a diagram here with the two types of motor, so you can see what I mean when I'm talking about the design choice and its impact on heat buildup. In general, if you have an outrunner and an inrunner of the same size, you will get more torque from the outrunner because the rotor is larger. Wanting good torque from a tiny motor was vital for the photon, so the outrunner made sense. The drawbacks are that it does not shed heat as readily as an inrunner and will have a lower top RPM. And we can see both of these things in the operation of the photon, with a max RPM on the flat of about 3000 and a rapid buildup of heat under throttle and demanding conditions, as well as slower dissipation of heat. And this is because most of the motor is not in direct contact with the heat sinking. The rotor is on the outside, so it spins inside the heat sinking block, which means that there's an air gap around most of the motor. If this air gap was not there, then the rotor would literally not be able to spin. And this means that the stator is on the inside, and the only point where direct heat transfer can take place is where the motor is bolted in position to allow the rotation to be transferred to the gearbox. And because of this, it can never be as efficient at shedding heat as an inrunner can. This is something that can clearly be seen in operation. If you ride in warmer weather and take the photon up to 90C, it throttles. But you can stop and you can put your hand on the heat sinking and it won't actually be that hot. And it's because of this limited surface area for heat transfer. If you keep going like this on the limit and check again, it will eventually be much hotter as there's been more time for the heat sinking to warm up. I do want it stated pretty clearly that this is not a criticism of the photon. CYC looked at the characteristics of the motor that were most important to them and they made the choice to go for the compact size with high torque. This is a motor built for its target market. It's not designed to be hot rodded or modified. This is just, I guess, to help explain to people what is going on with the motor and why it performs as it does. If when you spec out the bike you want, you need and require more sustained power than the motor can deliver, then you, you need to look at something else. Because in a nutshell, it's a 750 watt motor that lets you push it a bit more depending on weather conditions. Reliability. How reliable are these motors? As this is a brand new motor system, to a large extent, it will not be known for some time. CYC said in my communications that this has been developed for almost three years and has been extensively tested. I also know that the Generation X1 customers were essentially guinea pigs and there were huge reliability issues. These improved with Gen 2, but there were still issues with parts failing and needing replacement, including rotors and controllers. Based on what I hear, the Gen 3 stuff is much better. There do seem to be less complaints on the Facebook groups. The look and feel of the Photon certainly gives the impression of high quality, but I'm not an engineer. Over the next two years, it ought to become pretty clear how robust the internals are and the same for the electronics. With any new product, you're taking a risk to some extent. You do, however, have a two-year warranty, and it's essentially up to what you value. Do you want the latest in mid-drive technology or something that's been tried and tested? So far, the one I have has performed flawlessly. I've also not really put it over any washboard for a few hundred kilometers yet, and I still have just under 500 kilometers on it total. I like CYC, I like their innovation and their willingness to work with the DRA community. There are not many people though posting and saying yet yeah, that they've ridden their CYC for 10,000 trouble three kilometers. It's going to be very interesting to see if that starts to happen with this, because if it does, then we're going to know that CYC has for sure cracked it with this new generation. Does this replace the BBSHD or BBS02? For a lot of people, and in a lot of scenarios, I would say, yeah, it kind of does. There are some scenarios where I would say that a BBS HD would be a better choice still. But for the largest pool of people, this motor would make more sense than a BBS HD because it's lighter, it looks modern, and it has a good torque sensor. It's not that it's made the BBS HD a bad motor, it's just that there are millions more people that want to convert a bike to something in the 750 watt range. And for the riding they will do, the Photon is much nicer to ride. And yes, it's a bit more expensive, but that's partly because the Photon has a two year warranty. If you buy your BBS HD from a US dealer, then the cost is not that far off because they have to price things like warranty into their profit margins. For me, there are some notable exceptions. If you're hauling a heavy trailer or the bike is very heavy, like a trike or a tandem or some recumbents. If you want to hot rod it to the point where it's a stealth dirt bike. But these are niches compared to the number of commuters or leisure riders there are out there. And I think those people would probably be better off with a Photon. The biggest area where the BBS HD holds a current advantage is in reliability and repairability. 
if you use your bike for business, then being able to repair them fast is essential. The same if you go on a bike tour or if you ride every single day to work and depend on the bike. You can fix most things on the BBS HD very quickly. The Photon and CYC motors in general, it's more of a process involving delays to get parts. In the case of the Photon, if you were using this for your business and it took four weeks to have a simple repair done, like you would almost need to have a second motor as a backup. The turnaround just isn't that fast. Whereas a BBS02 or a BBS HD, you can fix with parts that you can get dirt cheap from dozens of places. If you're going on some kind of tour, I probably wouldn't take a CYC because you can't really fix them on the road easily in the way that you can with the Pafang stuff. But these are niches, and I think that they are much smaller ones than the niche or the niches that CYC is targeting with the Photon. Why would you get this over the CYC X1 or the Stealth? The advantages with the Photon are that you get a very compact motor that is much, much more stealthy than the Stealth in terms of size and noise. It's easier to install, it's lower maintenance without the second chain that comes with those. It's also very easy to set it up so that it's road legal to use in North America as well as Europe. It looks potentially more acceptable to people making decisions like police officers. I think it's more believable that a bike with one of these does meet the regulations. I know you can restrict an X1 in the same way, but it has a very different look and feel. It's lower power than either the Stealth or the X1, cost-wise it's not really that much cheaper. I would say have a good think about the type of riding that you want to do. If you don't want to do throttle only ripping around with the X1 or the Stealth, then it's a really good option. I think the pool of people that will be very satisfied with this motor outstrips the pool of people that want to go 80 kph on the throttle. What is the phone app like? Previous phone apps for both the Gen 1 and Gen 2 were not the greatest experience, so I was hoping that this app would be more polished. And I'm happy to say that so far, apart from the trip resetting and a few other gremlins, it's working very smoothly, at least for me. Again, we all use different phones, so for me, I have a relatively new Android device and it's very smooth in operation. I like the layout. It would be nice to be able to customize the data and the way it appears on the phone. Also maybe have alternate color mode so it shows easier in bright sunlight. I have though enjoyed using it while riding. The layout of information is pretty easy to understand. You have your display tabs and your settings tabs and you can change things either by clicking from menu or using a slider, which I have a bit of a gripe about because when the values are quite small, it's pretty easy to set a precise number but when there's a wider range, say 0 to 2000, you just don't have the same level of control. If there's a trick to this, I don't know about it, so please put it in the comments. Maybe at least give the option of tapping to enter a number. It annoys me that it says 1508 watts or whatever, rather than the 1500 that I would have entered with a keypad, which in the grand scheme of things probably doesn't matter, but I'm just of the opinion that you should use the most effective and accurate way of entering data rather than flashy sliders. The biggest improvement I think they could make would be to implement an inbuilt guide as to exactly what each option does and more importantly how it would affect the performance of the bike. The settings I got from stock were actually pretty good. In the past people have found it very hard to understand exactly what each parameter does. I followed the conversations online so it would seem to be a slam dunk to incorporate that via the app even if it's just links to video clips showing and describing the effects. I'm going to have a play with it when I get more time and if people want I can show you the results of trying out different settings but I do think this should be something that should be integrated. Another idea that I thought of would be to have like a bank of profiles that you can pick on depending on how you want to ride. Essentially pick a profile and load it to set the bike up for a purpose like a, a no sweating mode or a commuting mode or a riding the wet mode. I mean if two people share the same bike maybe like a family cargo bike both riders might have very different torque settings. Right now you can have different power levels on street and road mode, but I think that should be taken to the next step and having more parameters specific to a particular person would be the next level of the app. I might want very different throttle settings from the rain or on loose ground or different torque settings and I think I would find that very useful. So maybe now the app is out, perhaps they can look at adding something like that. Maybe the profiles can be user submitted even. Overall, I'm happy with the app. I just know that it could be something much more and perhaps now CYC have full control over development of it, maybe we'll get more features. Look beyond road and off-road modes that literally everybody has and have something that's fully customizable. 
people might end up with five or six modes refined for all kinds of purposes, but it's only going to be worth it if they can select them with a few taps. So, in conclusion, I'm impressed with the motor so far. It's very enjoyable to use. CYC has a huge opportunity that I hope they can take advantage of. If they can get the servicing and repair parts right and iron out production bottlenecks, then I think this motor could go far. I can't emphasize this point enough though, because if you make a motor that cannot be user serviced and then make the service part a slow and painful process, it's gonna be like a slow motion train wreck. It's definitely a wake up call to quite a few big companies to change how they're doing things. I think it also puts the companies making ready built bikes on notice, force them to deliver better value service and options, particularly the higher end places like Trek, Cannondale and Specialized. The amounts they're charging for weak motors tiny batteries is frankly daylight robbery. I'm going to be doing another update on this motor when I've done a lot more riding as well as some feedback on my longer distance rides as the year progresses. If you have any questions let me know in the comments and you can also join our discord server and chat to people on there. Huge thank you to everyone that's watching and especially people that support the channel directly. It's really very much appreciated and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.